many people. But so now we have the follow-up. 11 years later, we still don't have collisions for SHA-1, but we're getting closer every year. <laughs> and so the first talk is entitled Practical Freestyle Collision Attack on 76-Step SHA-1 by Pierre Kartman, Thomas Parrain, and Mark Stevens. And Pierre Kartman will give the talk. Thank you, Bart, for the nice introduction. So this is going to be the outline of my talk, so nothing really unusual. And uh, because it's early in the morning, I'll start with a few uh, recaps on hash functions. So a hash function is a mapping from strings of binary strings of arbitrary lengths to one of fixed length, let's say n. And it's a really useful primitive in crypto. You can implement many higher order things or, uh, with hash functions, typically hash and sign. You can do Mac. Uh, you can also do string ciphers, which is the other topic of this session. And, uh, but the thing that's a bit unusual with hash function is that they are keyless. So it makes things a bit more complex to evaluate the security to define what is a good hash function. But we know how to do that. I mean, they've been around for a long time. So usually we use three security notions. And in an informal way, that's what we have. The first two are quite related, they're pre-image resistance. And let's say we, I'm just given a target T and I want to find a message that hashes to this target. And uh, if I know nothing about the structure of the hash function, the best I can hope to do is to do sort of exhaustive search, and which has a complexity of about two to the n, and the, the length of the hash. Uh, second primitive is quite similar, but this time I'm given a message m, and I want to find a distinct one that hashes to the, to the same value with the same complexity. And then we have collision attacks, which are sort of ill-defined sometimes, but we just have, we want to find two, messages uh, that hash to the same value without any sort of condition of the messages beforehand. And thanks to the birthday paradox, we can do this is O2 to the n over two. Uh, things become more specific if we consider uh, practical constructions of hash functions. So for instance, let's consider merkel damgord hash functions uh, because uh, that's the kind of hash function that sha one is. And in this case, we just construct the hash from a compression function, which takes a message block of fixed length, an IV of fixed length, and, well, a chaining value of fixed length, and it hashes to a chaining value again. And then we can hash the message by chaining like this, the compression function, starting from an initial value that is fixed, and that is, uh, well, fixed in the definition of the hash function. And the nice thing about this is that we have a security reduction from the hash function to the compression function, because if I have an attack on, on the hash function, I can attack the compression function. So if I don't have an attack on the compression function, I know I don't have an attack on the hash function. But then if I have an attack on the compression function, it's not so clear what we get. I mean, it's not obvious that we can convert that to an attack to the whole hash, but at least it breaks the security reduction. Um, so if we consider functions that are Michael Damgord, for instance, we can have additional uh, attacks by considering the IV as an input to the attack. So for instance, if I, well, I won't really define some of free start, but let's say I want to do free start, it just means that as an attacker, I can decide what the IV is going to be. It's a, an additional freedom to the attacker, so we can also expect to do things that are a bit more powerful. And the variant of this sort of thing that, let's say I just want to attack exactly the compression function. So I won't have any chaining. I have to do everything in one block, but then I can control the additional input that is the chaining value. Uh, so in this work, what we did is uh, collisions on 76 steps out of 80 of the compression function of SHA-1. So it means it's, we attack 95% of SHA-1. And the nice thing about this attack in particular is that it's practical and we, complete, we computed uh, such a collision explicitly. And we did that with the GPU because it was fast. Uh, so a few details about SHA-1. So it was designed by NSA 20 years ago as a quick fix to SHA-0. And okay, the hash size is 160 bits. Uh, so we should expect a collision resistance of about 80 bits. Uh, so anything that is below that is an attack. And yeah, the blocks are 512 bits long. And the structure, uh, if we're a bit more specific, it uses a block cipher in Davis Mayer mode. And the block cipher inside is a five branch error rate first L. So we get this nice round function. And the message expansion uh, is linear and uses this formula. And if you attend in my RAM session talk, you should know that this rotation by one is the only difference between SHA-0 and SHA-1. I mean, the only significant one. And so there are 80 steps of this five cell structure. So in the picture, that's how it is. 
we have five 32-bit uh, words of state, and then we just do this operation with the Boolean function here. Okay. Uh, so, as Bart said, uh, SHA-1 has been attacked before, and uh, attacks have been presented in this room like 10 or 11 years ago. And uh, the main uh, breakthrough in uh, SHA-1 attacks was the attack by Wang Yin and Yu uh, 10 years ago. And they show collisions uh, for the whole hash function. And the way this attack works is that, uh, so we want to find, uh, we want to linearize the, the step function, and this will give us, we want to find a good differential path for a linear version of the step function. And uh, then we just want to compute many messages, and we hope that it follows the linear path, and we know that if it does, we get a collision. But this cannot work for the whole function, so we also need to get a nonlinear differential path at the beginning of the function, uh, especially to connect the linear part and the ID, because otherwise it cannot work. Uh, and also a very important feature of the Wong's attack is that uh, the technique of message modification, which allows to uh, speed up the attack by using, uh, making the best use of the freedom you have in the message, uh, so that the probabilities part of the attack uh, starts as late as possible. So the initial attack had a complexity evaluated to 2 to the 69 uh, equivalent of SHA-1 function, and it was eventually proved to 2 to the 61 by Stevens at Eurocrypt 2013. So this is the best we got so far for the hash function. So as a side note, if we consider pre-image resistance, SHA-1 is much more resistant because we don't know attacks on the full function yet. Maybe there isn't, well, I'm not going to make any hypothesis, but well, we don't know any public attacks on that. And uh, there are practical attacks up to about 30 steps uh, from also crypto 2008, uh, the Kanyar and Reisberger. And uh, if you want to have something, I mean, we, if we allow to have like, non-practical computation, we can do about double of that. And this is the talk at 1020 in this room, if you're interested. Um, so, okay, so much for the overview. What did we do? So uh, we wanted to, uh, okay, first let me justify why we did free start because as I just told you, there are attacks on the whole hash function. So what the point of doing something in an attack that is less applicable somehow because we need conditions on the IV. So essentially we wanted to do something that is practical up to the furthest we could. And uh, if we do free start, then we can start computing the things and the attack from a middle state because then we don't care so much about what IV we're going to get eventually. And we can hope that starting from the middle is going to get us, a, a, to give us an advantage uh, by giving a, a faster attack. And so, yeah, if I start from the middle, if I shift the message somehow, I can use freedom up to a later step. Uh, so the, the probabilistic part of the attack is going to start later. But then, as I said, uh, if you do this, you don't control the IV anymore. And potentially also you need to introduce differences in the IV. And uh, because you don't control what's going to happen in the beginning of the computation, you need to do something backward. Uh, you also have to be careful because if you have some conditions backward uh, when you compute, uh, maybe some of these conditions are going to be invalid. So you have to be careful about how you, you get things. So this is why we did three start. And in the picture, the rational, uh, it's exactly as I said. So this is what you would do for a usual attack. This green thing is the IV, the light green part is the part that is entirely determined by the, the freedom in the message. So you can put this to whatever you want. And then for this light blue part, you can use message modification to start, well, to, to, to get things for a few steps, and then eventually you have the purely probabilistic part. You just have to compute the message if you get a collision. So if you do free start, what you can hope for is that you can, you're going to initialize the state in the middle of the function somewhere, and then you also get entire uh, decision for this part. But then you have this backward computation I mentioned, so this you don't control really. You have to be careful because if you're going to invalidate things, if you have to check this every time, sort of, I mean, it doesn't make the attack more efficient. So you have to be confident that this is going to happen uh, uh, properly. And then, but then you could shift the, the, um, the freedom you get. So the, the probabilistic part of the attack starts a bit later, so it can make it more efficient. So then if you want to do this, what's the process? 
so the, the first step always is to find a good linear park. So you have to start with this, otherwise you cannot really uh, do anything. Uh, so you have to decide on that, and then you have to construct the nonlinear parts, like in the ones attack, but this time it's going to be shifted a bit because we have an offset. Uh, and then the final step, just when you want to implement the attack, is you have to, to find some ways to, accelerate, to, 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 make, to speed up things. So to find what I call accelerating techniques, message modification, the term I used before. So we did this for 76 steps, and the two reasons were, well, for the best practical result on collision on SHA-1 is 75, so we wanted to say, oh, we did more. Uh, and also the nice thing but is uh, the, the consequence of that is because SHA-1 has a five step structure with five words. If you have a collision on 76 step, you still have one of these words that's used in the final out output of SHA-1. So this gives you a partial collision on 32 bits. Of course, at a code that is really more uh, important than just doing this randomly, but I mean, you can still see it, which is nice. So uh, the first uh, thing I said we have to do is to find a good linear part. Uh, so the criteria for the, the, the usual one is just we want something of high probability because that's what's going to define the complexity of the attack in the end. Um, but here, because of our free start setting, uh, we also have these two extra conditions, so we need uh, because we, we get, if we get differences at the end of the five steps of this linear part, it means that we need to introduce differences in the IV so that we really get a collision. Uh, and uh, if we have a lot of such differences, the backward propagation is going to behave badly, so we want to avoid that. And also for the same reason, we want to avoid uh, to have too many differences in the early words uh, of the, the linear part, I mean of the message. Uh, so in the end, there were not so many candidates, and we picked the type 2550 uh, following manual notations. Is there anyone in the room who knows that, what that means? Okay, never mind. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, so this is the state I have. Uh, so the, the, we have 80 such steps. And if I have a dash, it means I have no difference here. And if I have a cross, it means I have one difference. So this is the differences in the message that I'm going to fix. This I can choose as an attacker. And if the, the, the message pair I chose follows the, the differential path, I'm expecting to have differences following this pattern. So you can see that there are actually very few differences, a bit more in the message, but that's expected in it. So this is the same I'm continuing from step 57 to 76. So these are going to be the five last uh, state words uh, at the end of the computation of the 76 steps. And so you can see that we have only two differences here. So we need to introduce those two differences in the IV to cancel. Um, okay, so next step is the nonlinear part. Uh, so to do this, we did it sort of in two parts. But it, well, the first one is easy, actually. You just want to find uh, a good prefix of very, with very few differences for the early part. So this is what I said would be the backward propagation. For at the beginning of the computation, we want something of really high probability, and especially high backward probability. So we want uh, to find this first, and then we're going to use uh, standard somehow, even though we improved it, way of constructing the nonlinear part uh, to bridge it with the linear part. So to do this, we use mostly the improved John local collision analysis, which comes from uh, Stephen's paper at Eurocrypt. Uh, and so um, at the end of this process, we got something that we were quite happy with. So it's a, a path with 236 conditions up to step 36. Of course, we don't have freedom up to step 36, but you, you can see that 236 is much less than the 512 bits of freedom we get in the message. So, and we get additional freedom in the IV. So this is quite good. Uh, so that's how it looks. Um, so you can see, or I'm telling you that this is the part uh, with the up to step five of high backward probability. You can see that there are a few differences. So the differences change name because now they are signed. I'm not going to enter into the details, but U and N are differences, and one and zeros are equalities. So anyway, this part, you can see that it's somehow quite sparse, but then at step six, seven, eight, you have three big carriage chains with many, many differences. So this is the intense part of the nonlinear part 
that uh, we need to compute efficiently. And then you can see that even after step 10, it's almost linear again. So it's a very, very uh, narrow, uh, well, I don't know, dense, non linear part. Uh, so now the last uh, item on my list was finding good accelerating techniques to implement the attack. And uh, so the two families, even though they're, they're quite related, but you have message modifications uh, where you want to, if you're trying to compute something, you're trying to make it follow the differential path, and then at some point it doesn't, so you're going to try to modify slightly the message so that now it fulfills a condition that it didn't before. Uh, but then you also have neutral bits which are uh, a bit different, so you're just generating good instances up to a certain step, and then you know that if I have something valid up to this step, I'm going to change one bit up, and it's going to give me an entirely different value here, but I know that it's also very likely to follow the differential path. So I can multiply good instances, and it's going to make things much more, much faster than just uh, straight forward uh, search. And so we chose to use neutral bits because basically they're easy to deal with, and especially they are quite easy to implement on GPUs in the end. Uh, and so I said that I would do things with an offset. I didn't mention so far what the offset was exactly. The most important one is for the neutral bits, and it's an offset of six. So it means that instead of using freedom in message words uh, W0 to 15, I do it from W6 to 21. So I got somehow six extra steps from using this uh, starting in the middle free start thingy. Uh, so if we sum up, uh, the, the attack is doing this. So first, we initialize a state with some offset. Then the same for the message words. Then we're using neutral bits with an offset. And this gives us a lot of neutral bits up to a quite late step compared to regular SHA-1 attacks. But then the drawbacks, of course, that we don't know the IV in advance, so it's going to give us something free start somehow. And uh, so we have differences in the IV, so it's really a free start, not so my free start. We do everything in one block, so in the end, it's really a collision on the compression function. So this is uh, what happens in the picture. This is where we initialize the state in practice. This is what we compute with the message freedom. And then this is the offset we use for the message. So this, the, the, this whole window is the message freedom we get. But this uh, darker shade of orange is where we actually, the words where we actually have neutral bits. And these neutral bits are going to act from step 18 to 26. So this is the whole part where we can sort of uh, speed up things. Um, okay, uh, so now I'm going to mention how we implemented this thing uh, to make it efficient somehow. And uh, we did that on a GPU because uh, we wanted to have fun and uh, we wanted to try if it would be efficient and it turned out that it is. Uh, so we used a nice uh, cheap gamer GPU, the NVIDIA GTX 1070. We got a free video games with that actually. Uh, that was nice. And uh, so it's a quite recent one, and it has 1,664 cores at about one gigahertz. Uh, and the nice thing with the NVIDIA GPUs is that it allows to do sort of high-level programming with the CUDA framework. But usually NVIDIAs, they're supposed to be less efficient for, for crypto programs somehow. But the, actually, this one is quite nice because for all of the, the instructions we need, so 32-bit arithmetic, basically, uh, you can have a throughput of one uh, instruction per cycle per core. So optimally, you can really use all of these 664 cores at the, the best. Uh, the only exception is for the rotation, which is a bit unfortunate because we have quite a few rotation in the computation. Uh, but well, it's still quite nice in our opinion. And also it's quite cheap, so 500 Singapore dollars. Uh, you can make the conversion in whatever currency you're using, but we bought this one in Singapore, so well. Um, so then, okay, I have nearly 2,000 cores, but it's not like I can use them uh, to implement like regularly on a CPU, especially because the threads that are going to run on this core are, are, are packed in warps, what is called a warp, of 32 threads. And for these warps, we have a model which is single instruction, multiple threads. So all of the warps, all of the threads of the same warp have to execute exactly the same instruction. So if I have a, a divergence in the control flow because I had underneath some conditional somewhere, uh, basically everything is going to be serialized. So the thread that are going to follow this conditional will execute the one that I don't, just uh, shut down for a bit, and then they reactivate. And so 
because of this, you really want to avoid branching because uh, at worst, then you lose a factor 32 of uh, what you could have. And well, also, yeah, you tend to group threads in very big blocks uh, to hide latency for many things. Um, so the approach we used uh, to uh, counter somehow this uh, branching problem is uh, just to use shared buffers for partial solutions up to, so I have like partial solutions up to some step, and for these solutions up to the same step, I'm going to store them in the same uh, shared buffer. Uh, and then the process is that at, I have a block of threads and they're all going to load uh, their own partial solution, and they're all going to try all of the neutral bits available for this step, and every time they get a, a solution up to the next step that is valid, they will store it in the next uh, shared buffer. And uh, so that's how we decompose uh, the computation between the CPU and the GPU. So up to step 17, we just generate what we call base solution on the CPU because it's not too expensive and it's more like a, uh, you can do that offline, even online actually. And then uh, we use all of the neutral bits uh, on the GPU because that's what it's here for. And uh, we also check further solution up to, I mean, we do further check on the GPU and eventually the collision check is done on the CPU because we have so many things up to 56 to check. It, it's a, a waste to just use the GPU for that. So the process in a small picture is like this. Uh, so let's say I start here, uh, the computation, and I'm just going to say, okay, do I have any solutions up to 20, step 25, enough of them? If yes, I'm going to load them in my, from my buffer. I'm going to try to extend them up to step 26. And then uh, the valid things I have up, up to step 26, I store them in this buffer solutions up to 26. And then I start again and again. And if I don't have anything, eventually I will just load base solutions that were produced by the CPU, and I extend them, and I do this infinitely until I have a collision. So the results we got, uh, so as I said, we just had one single GPU, quite cheap. And with one GPU, you can generate partial solution up to step 26, uh, one per minute on average, which is, well, quite nice. And uh, because we know the probability of, having a, uh, of following the path from step 56 to the end, we can have a very good estimate of the complexity of the final attack. And this is about five days, slightly less, like four days and a half. And the equivalent complexity of this is about 2 to the 50 upon 25 SHA-1 compression function. And uh, if we compare to what we would have on a CPU, so we implemented the same process on a CPU, uh, rather recent high clocked one, and this would take about 600 days. So the speed up we get from the GPU, I mean, one GPU is worth 140 such cores, which is quite nice. And uh, especially if we compare to a previous attempt uh, at implementing SHA-1 attacks on GPUs, uh, and then they got a speed up of about 40. So we were quite happy with this. Uh, but then um, if we compare to the speed up we get for raw SHA-1 computation, it's 320. So we still lose a factor about two from the branching. But in our opinion, this factor 2.3 is still not bad and we were quite happy with the result. So that's the end of my talk, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.